Well, good morning and welcome. We're so glad you're here as we uh, continue our sermon series, Fearless Generosity. Last week we talked about fearless living, and we heard, as we heard, uh, I read today by Ron, that in the book of Ephesians, we're invited to imagine and see what God is doing in our lives, that God has an imagination and a life for us, sometimes that we can't even begin to see, but it's beautiful and amazing and full and generous. Amen? And, uh, and so God calls us to continually be attentive to that, and then we spent time with the book of Genesis about God's goodness and the beauty of creation and how we're uh, called to care for creation, or that ancient word, steward. Do you remember that? A steward is to care and to shepherd and to tend all the gifts and generosity God has provided. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, fearless uh, investing or fearless sowing, and we're going to talk about what does it mean for us not only to invest our financial gifts in the work of Christ and the world and the kingdom of God, but how do we invest ourselves? So it's beyond, it's being beyond fearless living that we live bold and courageous lives, but we also take some risk and we offer ourselves and our gifts in ways that could forever transform the world. So will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we're thankful for this beautiful day. We're thankful for the opportunity to worship and praise you, to hear the word read so beautifully, and, and to sing together in some powerful ways, longing for your peace in the world and in our hearts. We're grateful for these readings that uh, call us once again to imagine your dream for us, that sometimes is more than we could ever envision, but you continue to call us to more and more than we can imagine. And we're grateful for this parable, this story that Jesus told about a planter, a farmer, and how these seeds fell in different places, and how that represents the way we receive the word and how we live our lives in faith. So open our hearts deeply to what you would say to us today. Challenge us to not be fearful, but to be courageous and to be bold. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I, I uh, grew up on a farm, we know that all the time, and uh, uh, my grandfather, uh, when I was about third or fourth grade, said it's time for you to plant your own garden, and some of you have heard that story. And he had a massive garden around his house, and then he had another garden at a different part of the farm, and my, my grandfather was green thumb deluxe, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but he really wanted me to take the opportunity uh, to do my own planting, you know, my own kind of garden work. And I mean, as a third grader, you kind of think, this is not really what I want to do, amen, right? It, uh, I'd rather do something else. But I loved my grandfather, and I knew he wanted to invest time in me, and so he said, we're going to do it. Now, I thought it would be in his garden, right, so that he could water and care for it, and I wouldn't have to, right? But he said, we're going to do it at your house. So he came down with a shovel and a hoe, and he came down with a bunch of packets of seeds, and he said, you're going to dig up this section of the yard, and you're going to turn it over and get rid of the grass, and you're going to prepare uh, this space for a garden. And I, I, of course, was very respectful of him. I said, yes, sir, but internally I thought, this is a mistake, right, you know? So we began to dig up this very small square of the yard, and the grass is really aggressive, you know, it's, it's everywhere, and he kept making me pull it out, and weeds, and all that kind of stuff, and then turn the soil and break it up. I mean, I, there were these things called rototillers, but he didn't believe in them, right, you know? And so, you know, a third grader and a shovel, it's a bad day, right? It took, it took almost all the morning. And then after we had kind of broken it up, uh, then he said, well, you're going to create rows with your hands, and you're going to plant seeds there. And so we did. We spent most of the day planting this garden, and then I had to water it, and then he set out a schedule for me, and he said, you have to pull weeds, and you know, all that stuff. So we planted radish seeds, which are really small, and we planted okra. Uh, I, some of you up here in the north don't know what okra is. How many know what okra is? Yeah, love it, love it. Um, and then tomatoes and uh, uh, cabbage and, and lettuce seed, which is so small, and all these different things, and then corn. And I remember, though I had grown up on a farm, I just thought, this is not going to work, especially those lettuce seeds. I mean, they're really minuscule. But I remember going out every day, watering, being a part of the garden, trying to keep the grass from choking it out. The birds came and ate some of the seed, you know, that's how they do. Uh, and, uh, but eventually, some of the lettuce broke through. And I was so amazed. I'm easily impressed, you know that. But I was so amazed at the beauty of what was coming up. And then that lettuce flourished. 
and the radishes went from small seeds to these large red radishes. But the corn was the most amazing to me, that this one kernel could do this amazing thing and then produce these ears of corn much more uh, than I could imagine. So it was a great lesson in gardening, right? And I've gardened in every place but here, uh, because I have an apartment and I have some pots, but it's hard to till a garden in somebody else's yard, right? Uh, but, but it's always been important to me, and I, always, I just am always grateful for the lessons learned about gardening, which kind of carry over into our faith. Now, Jesus, he did that all the time. Like, he took these regular stories, and, uh, and, and, and he loved telling farm stories and relationship stories and family stories. Uh, so we're going to look at one of the stories from chapter 4 of Mark. Now, remember Mark is the first gospel written, probably around 70 A.D., it is uh, written quickly because it was desperately needed, and so it, it lacks a lot of the uh, fluff, if you will, or additional stories. No birth story, no wise men, it just gets to the point. It starts with Jesus' baptism. So shortly after his baptism, Jesus begins to teach, and he teaches with stories, or what we call parables, right? And, and there's this great story. So uh, Jesus began to teach beside the lake again. So a lot of his ministry was around Sea of Galilee. We were just with the confirmation class on Lake Michigan, and we read a little bit about Jesus and the Sea of Galilee, and it just takes on a different feel when you're hearing the waves crashing in, right? And uh, so Jesus is there, and he gets in a boat, and then he looks at the crowd on the shore. It's kind of nat natural amphitheater, and he says, a, a sower went to sow, or a planter, or a farmer. Now, this is the culture I grew up in, so uh, I'm going to have uh, Eric, that's what I'd like to see, right? Uh, that, that kind of big tractor, planter, uh, you know, that's what I grew up with, right? And th so when I think of planting, I think of very orderly, uh, intentional, drive the tractor, plant the seed, it's all in rows. And for a type A, this is the way life should be, amen, right? But in the ancient world, those didn't exist, as you well know. So in the ancient world, a farmer would gather a big sack of seed and it depended on the time of year. It could be barley, it could be wheat, it could be other things. And he or she would toss those seeds generously into the field, right? And they didn't have an international harvester tractor to come back over it. So either they would have their family walk back and forth to get the seed underground, right? Or they would get a very primitive plow with some oxen or just drive the oxen across the field. And then that would create the reality. But when you're throwing seed, right? Seed lands in all kinds of places, and so then you realize that what this story means. So I'm going to have Eric keep that image up for you as you hear this story. So Jesus sat in the boat and had the crowd listen, and he does say this, listen to what I'm saying. And he said, listen to this. A farmer went out to scatter seed, and now you have a deeper sense of what that looked like. As he was scattering seeds, some fell on the path, and birds came and ate it. So, uh, you know, uh, along different parts of our gardens and so forth, if seed falls on the concrete, it's not going to take hold, right? It's too hard. It's not possible. And birds are ready for seed, and so they fly in and take it, and it never gets an opportunity. And then he says, uh, and, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where the soil was shallow, and they sprouted immediately because the soil wasn't deep. And uh, apparently in Palestine, Israel, there are lots of places like that where the soil looks like it's decent, but underneath is rock, right? And if you've ever been uh, to certain parts of the country, you see that there's some light soil. And if you've planted that way before, the, the plant comes up pretty quickly, right? Because it's, it, it's easy, but then when they go to make root, it doesn't happen, right? Something blocks it. It's usually the rock or the rockiness. And then he says, when the sun came out, it scorched the plants and dried them up because they had no roots, and then Jesus says, other seed fell among the plant, uh, the thorny plants, or what we would call weeds, and they grew up and choked the seeds, and they produced nothing. And on our farm, and probably in your garden, and in every other place in your yard, there's some aggressive weed or grass, right? Uh, and if you live in the south, it's called kudzu. It just takes over, right? It just chokes everything out. And so if something's planted near that, unless you're meticulous at removing it frequently, it dies, right? Amen. But then there's this interesting part of the story. Other seed fell on good soil and bore fruit. And upon growing and increasing, the seed produced, in one case, a yield of 30 to 1. And I want to say to you, in the ancient world, that would have been a good turn, right? That would have been a good crop. That would have, the farmer would have been pleased with that. But then Jesus goes on to say, 
In another case, 60 to 1. That would have been amazing. And then another 100 to 1. That means 100 pieces of grain or something compared to the one seed. Whoever has heard this, whoever has ears, listen and pay attention. And so Jesus not only tells a farming story about planting and the sowing of seeds, but what he does is he tells us that when it falls on good soil, it might produce something pretty good, it might produce something pretty amazing, but it could produce something miraculous, right? But it only comes when we cast the seeds and begin to invest ourselves, right? And, I, and, I, and so you know how this all plays out, because Jesus goes on to explain it in the next set of verses, that sometimes when we receive God's word or God's invitation to invest, we throw that, that word or that experience or God's call uh, onto a path. And, and, and I don't know about you, but sometimes we're, we're pretty packed down, right? I'm stamping down like I'm packing dirt. But you know what I'm saying? If, if stuff falls on something really hard, it won't grow. And, and sometimes, maybe not you, but sometimes I'm in a place where either I'm so hard I can't receive what God is saying to me because I've been wounded or hurt or I'm mad or I don't think it's worth it, or I'm just resistant. Anybody resistant in here, right, you know? Or sometimes you know that. You've invested yourself into something important uh, that you feel God has called you to do, whether it's a project at work or something with your family or mending a relationship or whatever it may be, and you just hit that brick wall, right? The second one is, is even interesting, too. I, I think that happens to me sometimes. I I get excited about doing something for God, or I get excited that Jesus has called me to something, or I just get excited about wanting to do something, but I don't do the work of, of preparing and getting ready. And, and sometimes uh, you'll know that when you come to a class and you'll go, well, that wasn't too great. And you're right, because I didn't. And so when we try to go deep, uh, there's no roots. And when things get tough, uh, we shrivel and die, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, you know what it's like to not be prepared or rooted. And so when people say you know, to me, and this is not a guilt thing, it's just a reality thing, I, I, don't need to, I don't need to come to church all the time because I'm busy. But the deal is, if you're not feeding yourself with God's Word and in sacred community, when it gets tough, there's no roots. You know what I'm saying? It's hard to be rooted if you don't have this place where you've continued to re recharge. Again, it's not a guilt thing, it's a reality thing. You know what I'm saying? And then thirdly, uh, we often get excited about stuff or we get renewed in our commitment to follow Jesus or we're going to pray more or we're going to serve more or we're going to take a risk and invest our gifts or ourselves in ways that we hadn't imagined. And then what happens, right? What happens is that other people say, oh, you don't have time for that or work gets in the way or the demands of our life get in the way and it chokes us out. You know what I'm saying? And then we, we're unable to move forward. But when we're good soil, when we're able to open ourselves deeply to let that seed of Jesus fall in us and root itself deeply and grow, something miraculous happens. And sometimes when we take the risk and throw ourselves into something or commit ourselves to the work of Jesus in some place, something miraculous happens, right? But it only happens if we're willing to take the risk, right? You know, if you hold on to the seed and keep it in the package, it's never going to grow, right? If you're too afraid or too fearless or you're afraid you'll be choked out or you're not deep enough or whatever it may be, if, if you don't risk yourself and your gifts and your generosity and your talents, then you might miss it, right? Uh, and we were just on the confirmation retreat, and uh, it was just a very powerful weekend for me, honestly. And, you know, I kind of went driving to Sheboygan. I mean, that's not my destination place, right, you know? And, and so I'm headed to Sheboygan. Uh, Carrie Ann is letting us use her uh, lake house for our retreat, and I've had a lot going on for the week, and I just thought I could be doing so many other things, right? But you know, something deep within me said, you need to go, right? And I went. And I went reluctantly, and I probably had a little hardness and busyness, and I kept thinking I have so many other things to do, but I went. And when the kids arrived, it was like something transitioned because those eight confirmands were amazing. They really were. And they, 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 they showed some innocence and openness and risk about faith uh, and about life and about their own journey that just reminded me that if I'm not willing to be courageous, then I'm not going to really experience that amazing harvest that we read about in Scripture. Yesterday, or over, they did this 
trust and ropes course, you know these things, and if you saw me post some of the pictures, uh, I will assure you I did not do the climbing wall, right? But um, I was amazed at them. Like, they just did it, right? They just jumped up and, and they did all this stuff, and they worked in crossing uh, paths and chasms, and they had to do all these kinds of interesting pieces together, and, and they were risk takers. I mean, they were willing to risk themselves to help the other person get across or risk themselves, and they encouraged one another, and, and they just did some amazing stuff. And when we got to the climbing wall, I mean, it's freezing, and this thing is taller than this room. I mean, it was unbelievably tall. And, and you know, myself, thinking about liability insurance, said maybe we shouldn't do this, right? You know what I'm saying? And I thought of several of the parents in the room and said, oh, this is going to be a mistake, right? But then I just watched these kids jump up on the wall and just go to the top, you know? Just climb it and encourage each other and take the risk and ring this bell at the top. And I thought, my word, that's what this is about, right? It's about being courageous. And not everybody made it to the top and not everybody could do the wall. And, and then they encouraged each other in other places. But... Annalise Dreyer, she's, 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 just, she's a smaller person than me, right? And, and she says, I'm going to do it. And, I, and, and I, Literally, it's a good thing I didn't raise kids. I was like, are you sure you should do this, right? She didn't get up the first time. But then she got up the second time. And then it's almost dark. It's, it's not too dark, parents, relax. But she says, I've got to do one more. And she did. And she stood in this little window, a thousand feet high, and rang this bell, and I, this whole sermon took on a new life for me. Are you that brave? Are you that courageous? Are you willing to do something for God and invest your gifts, your finances, your talents, your abilities, your leadership? Are you going to climb on out and take the risk? Or are you going to stay in the package and miss the opportunity? I'm grateful for yesterday. I'm grateful because lately I have felt pretty fearful about a number of things. And I don't like being afraid, do you? Really, aren't you tired of being afraid? I don't want to be afraid. I want to be bold and courageous, and I want to do something amazing, and I want to invest myself and my gifts, and I want us to invest our gifts in the work of God in the world and in this community so that we can change the world. And it took eight seventh and eighth graders and the work of the Holy Spirit to say, that's what we're about. So be courageous. Be bold. And I challenge you this week as I did last week. And some of you have been emailing me some of the fearless living things you've done this week. Think about fearless investing. What's one thing you could step into or do that would make you so uncomfortable but might change everything? And the people of God said, amen. So receive this benediction as we go forth. The world would have us be afraid, amen? Amen. But Jesus calls us to be fearless. The world would have us withdraw or, or, or not risk it or keep our seeds in the packet, right? But Jesus says, be courageous and bold. Invest yourself in your gifts so that the world may be changed. So be fearless, my friends, as we go forth from this place and live a bold faith that changes the world. Mm -hmm.